Today we're going to be talking about closure, which is a topic that confuses a bunch of people, but it's actually really, really simple once you understand it. This video is in two parts. In the first part, I'm going to show you with code what closure is and why it matters. That's going to take about 10 minutes, and by the end of that, you will understand closure. We're also going to be looking at how closure is used in the real world, and it's likely that you are already using closure. JavaScript is a language that has what we call function portability. That means that in JavaScript, all functions are actually Lambda functions. That means they exist as independent objects. You can assign them to variables. You can move them from place to place. You can have multiple variables pointing at the same function if you want to. You can put functions into objects and they become effectively methods. In fact, methods are just functions in JavaScript. Here's a simple function in JavaScript. You can see I haven't done anything with it. I haven't called it. If I want to use this function, I'm probably going to want to save it into a variable. Let's put something inside the function body so we can see it being called. And now we call this function like this. So what will happen, for example, if I do this? Well, there are two possible things that could happen. Either it could output the word cats, or it could do something else. Let's press enter and see what it actually does. And you see it outputs the function itself. That's because the function itself is pointed to by this variable x. x is a pointer to the function which exists elsewhere. Now, what if I was to do this? You can see now that I've created a new variable called y, and I've put the contents of x into it. y is this function. x is also this function. These are two variables that are pointing to the same function. This is entirely legal in JavaScript. The function itself is an object. And when I say an object, I don't mean in some metaphysical way. It is an object in the same way that every other object you create in JavaScript is an object. If you create a class and you instantiate that class and you get an object out the other side, that's an object. JavaScript functions are objects in exactly the same way as this. All functions in JavaScript are objects, and that includes methods too. Let's say I do this. So I've now created an object called z. And see here, I put the value of x, which was our function, into an object called z with an attribute of a. I can now call this, and it's calling the same function. You see, I can move a function from one place to another place. It's entirely legal in JavaScript to do this. In fact, it's encouraged. This is composition over inheritance. This sort of radical function portability means that you need some way of having functions continue to work, regardless of where you put them. If I move a function from one place to another place, I want that function to continue functioning where it is. You might, for example, want to treat a function as an event listener, in which case you'll want to create it in one place, and you'll want to then pass it into the DOM so that it can listen to events. It was created in one place. It's being moved to a new environment. This is what Clojure gives us. Clojure lets us move functions from place to place and still expect them to work. This is just a simple HTML page. It loads index.js, which is here. OK, now I'm going to make a function. I'm calling this function outer for reasons that will become parent later on. Let's make a variable x, and I'm going to put the number 12 into it. And then I'm going to console.log x. We run outer. We can see we get the number 12 out, as you'd expect. What happens if I console.log the value x out here? And it could either output the number 12, or it could crash, or it could output undefined. x is not defined, because we're trying to access it out of scope. We've defined the value of x inside this function. And this value here only exists inside this function. It's local to this function. Now, what if I do this? Now I've defined the value of x outside of the function. This is now a global value, x. So when I run this, we'll see that x is available in this scope, in this child scope here, and also in this scope. Because when you try to access a variable in JavaScript, it will look in its current scope and it will look up as well, up into the parent scopes, to all the variables that are available above. OK, now what if I do this? Inside this function here, I've created the variable x equals 15. And out here, I've created the value x equals 12. So what's going to happen here? We can see that we get first 15 and then 12. And why has this happened? Well, first of all, We've run outer, and this has used the value of x from inside the function scope here. This is the most local value of x. And here, where we type console.log x, it's used the global value of x here. 
you see we've overwritten the value of x in this local scope. Okay, now this all makes sense so far, I hope, and this is where we start to get to closure. Now what if inside of outer, instead of simply console.logging x, I was to create another function. I was to create a function inside a function. Now remember that functions are just uh, objects in JavaScript. You can create them wherever you want to. There's no requirement that they have to be created on the global scope. You can make them wherever you like. Anyway, you can make any kind of variable. You can also make a function. So let's do that now. So I'm going to come into here and I'm going to make a function called inner. And in the side of this, we'll do our console.log. Now we have to call this function. So let's do that. Wow. This is kind of crazy, right? This is code that some of you will have seen often and some of you may have, may have never seen before. This notion that you can create a function wherever you like and just save it in a variable wherever you like and really just move it around. So what's going to happen here when we console.log x? Well, first of all, it's going to look for a value of x inside this function scope, and it's not going to find one because there isn't one. So it's going to look up into the parent scope. It's going to look into this scope just here, and it's going to find, ah, here's the value of x. This is the value that we should use. And so when we execute this now, we're going to find that it will output the value of 15. And here we are. Okay, this is all very nice, but it's not really closure yet. We can turn this into a closure like this. Instead of executing inner right here, I'm going to return inner. That's right, this is a function that returns another function. Functions can return other functions in JavaScript because a function is a valid data type. Again, this might seem slightly strange, but this is something we do all the time in JavaScript. In fact, I can guarantee that you're already doing this in several places. So let's just receive this value. Okay, I've returned a function and I've received it back into this variable here called return function. Now let's just console.log return function. What do you think will happen here? You can see that the value of return function is actually literally the function. It is this function just here. This is the function that's been returned from this function. So how to execute this function? Well, it's very easy. We just put braces on it. Now, the question is what will happen now? Look at this function here, this return function. I'm executing this in the global scope. I'm executing it in the scope in which x equals 12. But the function was defined in a scope in which x equaled 15. So the question is, what will happen when I execute this function? Will we get the value of 12 or will we get the value of 15? In fact, if I was to delete this, would we get broken code? Would we get undefined? And you can see we get the value 15. We get the value that was present when this function was first defined. And this is a closure. When you define a function, your function gains a permanent reference to all the variables that were in scope when it was first created. So why do we call this a closure? Well, what if we were to call return function dot x, for example, it's undefined. It's not an attribute of the function. It's a local variable that's in closure. It's not accessible from outside in any way. If I was to try and get x, you see, I get the global value of x. I can't get the x that's in this function because this function has exited. And all the variables inside it, although they're still available to the functions that were declared inside that function, they are closed over. They are in a closure. A closure is closed over. This is why we call it a closure. And this is the way of getting private variables in a language that doesn't by default have private variables. We can create them inside the closure and they then just become local variables to that function. And they're only accessible to other functions that were declared at the same time inside this function. They are private variables in a language that does not have private variables. Closure. Now you're probably looking at this and thinking, this is a weird code. Why would I ever want this? And the answer is, you do want this all the freaking time and you're actually using it already. This is my cat list application. You can see I've got a list of cats just here and uh, I can select a cat and it becomes the cat that I choose. I spent way too long on this. You should subscribe. See, I've got three files. I've got a main, which just renders a cat list. I've got my cat list. This just iterates over a list of cats here and runs a bunch of cats in list items. And then there's the cat itself, which is just some divs here that I've mucked around with CSS. It's all about Celia, to be honest. 
This is the event handler. This is the code that gets called when you click. Look where this is defined. This is defined inside the cat list. Now, look where this function gets called. It gets passed into the cat as a prop, and it gets called in the cat. But it's operating in the context of the cat list because it needs to call methods inside the cat list. So you see that I've passed this function in, and it's brought its call stack with it. It means that I can define the function out here. I can pass it into a completely new context, the cat, and it's still going to work. And just have a think about it for a minute. How else could it possibly work? If you're defining a function in one place, and then you're expecting it to be called later, at a later date, be this on a, a, a timeout or uh, an event handler or whatever, it's being called in a different context, but you still want it to be able to interact with the code that was there when you first defined that function. Okay, write this down because this is the definition. A closure is a portable function scope. When you create a function, all the variables that were in scope when you first created that function, continue to be in scope for the lifetime of that function, as long as that function exists. And it doesn't matter what you do with that function subsequently, you can pass it into another context. You can pass it somewhere where those variables are not available. Those variables will still be available to that function, and that is a closure. So first of all, we don't need this x equals 12 because we're not accessing it anywhere. Okay, now what about this outer? So you can see that the only purpose of this outer function is to generate the inner function. So we sort of don't need it. If, if we're just going to call it once and get its return value, why even assign it to a variable? I'm going to take all of this. I'm going to put it here. I'm going to wrap it in braces for syntactic reasons. And then I'm going to call it right away. This is actually quite a common pattern in JavaScript. I've created here a function, and within this function, I can store as many local variables as I like, and they stay private to this function. I don't actually need this assignation at the top here. I can actually, if I want to, simply execute this directly, and then rather than returning, I can do this. In a browser, the window object refers to the global scope. All global variables are actually attributes of window. So if I create a new attribute of window, I'm actually creating a global variable. I can put anything I want into here. I can put helper functions into here if I want. I can put other variables into here. And any data that I put into this closure will remain private. And the only thing that will have access to this later is this inner function, which I've smuggled out. I've smuggled out by making it an attribute of the global scope window just here. This is actually called the module pattern here. And this is the basis of JavaScript modules. When you create a, a variable in JavaScript, by default, you're creating a global variable. It's a variable that's available everywhere. And it doesn't matter what file you put this into. You could put this into um, some other file. And, and if you're importing it from your index.html, if you create a global variable in any file, it's global for all the files. This is a design flaw in JavaScript. I, mean, I hesitate to use the word flaw because I love JavaScript, but uh, that is a little bit of an issue. So what CommonJS modules do is they secretly wrap every single file you have inside a closure. Okay, let's install Webpack. Creating my package.json. I've created a file here called catNamer. CatNamer has uh, a cat name. And it has a function here that can console.log that cat name. Look at this variable here. This is declared at the root scope. In old style JavaScript, this would be a global variable. This would be global not just to this file, but to every single file in the entire project. And this is actually quite a serious problem because other files can change global variables. They can overwrite them. If we were on npx webpack, you can see it generates a dist folder. If we look for our cat namer inside of here, we can find it. Here it is. And look what it's wrapped in. It's wrapped in a function. Webpack has implicitly wrapped our code in a function. And that means that any variables that are declared inside that function are private variables. Cat name becomes a private variable inside this function. Cat namer here is also private inside this function. So how is this value extracted? Well, you can see here that we call webpack required.d and we pass it an object. And this object contains an attribute cat namer, and it passes out the cat namer. So the cat namer is being passed out 
to Webpack require. And it's been added as an attribute of Webpack exports. Webpack exports is declared at a higher level. And we can then get hold of this from other functions. And crucially, only catNamer can be imported into other functions. CatName remains completely private. <laughs> this final part is in the Babel REPL. This is a really useful website that lets you type ES6 and see what it transpiles down to. Remember, everything in ES6 has to be able to transpile to ES5 because it has to be able to work in older browsers. This is a design principle of JavaScript. In fact, you can transpile everything that's in ES6 all the way down to ES5, ES4. You can just keep going all the way down because everything that's in JavaScript is built out of smaller language features. I'll talk more about this in another video. I'm just going to make a class just now. And you can see this transpiles to a newable function. A newable function is the earlier way of making objects in JavaScript. It's basically just a function that returns an object. Let's just add a method. And now look at this. You should recognize this is an iffy. This is an instantly invoked function executable. Uh, it's got the braces at the end here, and it's a function. So everything inside of this is actually a closure. Thank you very much for watching. I want to make a lot more videos like this one. So if you found it helpful, please do subscribe. And this is a closure.